All right, notice with me this morning as we come to 2 Samuel chapter 16. I'm going to title the message this morning, Shimei and Responding to Slander. Last week we preached out of Proverbs 6, and we titled that message, Sowing Discord. And next week I'm going to be preaching a message if I don't change my mind, or the Lord don't change my mind, in Romans 13, 13, titled, Christians and Writing. And then that Sunday night, we'll be in our Thessalonians series, we'll be looking at um, a brotherly love. And so that, hopefully, we'll be able to do those next week. Notice as we come here to this chapter, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 5. And again, I want to speak to you about a biblical response to slander of those who are filled with anger, bitterness, and revenge. And we all have experienced that at one time or another, have we not? And it is important that we know how to respond. And as a minister, I truly understand this subject. And especially when the accusations are lies and they come against us, how do we respond to that? Do we get drawn into debates and arguments and become a fool as they are? Or how do we respond to that? Well, notice as we come here, reading from verse 5, it says, And when King David came to Bahurim, Behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gara. And he came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned, and the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into, thy, into thee hand rather of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man." Father, we thank Thee this morning for the privilege to be in Thy house with Thy people of like precious faith. And Father, we thank You, Lord, for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for the privilege to serve You for the time to come and worship this morning. Lord, we just pray for Thy presence and we pray for Thy blessings upon the reading of Thy Holy Scripture. And Father, we pray that You speak to our hearts. Lord, help us be attentive to the Holy Spirit and the words that you've given to us in your Bible. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for a beautiful day. We ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to get into this text this morning, and I want to give you some biblical examples of how to respond to slander. And then maybe toward the end of the message, I want to give you some personal examples. You know, I could read a book and get examples out of books, but I'd rather get them out of the Bible and then our own personal experiences that we've had. Silence is golden when dealing with fools. Silence is golden when dealing with those that will slander us. And so that's what we want to talk about here today. Now, in the context of the background of what we're going to be looking at today... Chapter 15, we did not turn there, but I made mention of chapter 15. We find that in chapter 15, David is fleeing from his son Absalom, a spoiled son, who took his throne by sowing discord among the citizens of the kingdom and stealing the hearts of the people and turning the people away from David. That is in chapter 15. And again, I made some comments and gave you the scriptures on that last week. Absalom was a wicked man who slandered his father, sowed discord among the citizens of the kingdom, and turned them against the king, and turned them against David, of course, uh, the king. And, uh, And so he did a very wicked thing. 
When we come to chapter 16, David is still on the run. As a matter of fact, notice with me in chapter 15 and in verse 30, it says, And David went up by the ascent of Mount Olive, and wept as he went up, and had his head covered, and he went barefoot. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up weeping as they went up. So David is on the run. And when we come into Second Samuel 16, we see that David is still on the run with his household and some of his friends and some of his soldiers. And when we come into this chapter, as we just read in verse 5, man by the name of Shimei, he's of the household of uh, Saul, a relative to King Saul. And he comes out in verse 5, it says, In the latter part he came forth and cursed still as he came. So he's a Benjamite of the household of Saul. He's following David. He's cursing David. He's throwing stones at David, as we're going to see in the text. And he's bringing false accusations and also kicking up dust. So he comes out to slander David. Now, if you want to read about Shimei's story, I'm only going to camp out here in this text. But in chapter 19, verses 16 through 23, David later forgives this man of his sins as David was uh, went uh, took his throne back. And in 1 Kings 2, verse 8 and 9, on David's deathbed, he still doubted the integrity of Shimei, and he told Solomon to deal with him. And Solomon, three years later after David's death, executed him because he disobeyed command. So if you want to read about his whole story, I'm not interested in the rest of that this morning. I'm interested in uh, the text here of his slandering of David. But you can read about his whole story and these other passages I just gave. And uh, where Solomon executed him would be in 1 Kings 2, 36-37. Now let's look at our text here this morning. Notice with me as we come back here to verse uh, to verse 5, the latter part of verse 5. And you see my outline. We're going to first of all talk about Shimei's willful folly. Secondly, we're going to talk about Abishai's bold recommendation. And number three, we're going to talk about David's humble response. Now we're talking about dealing with slander. We've all experienced this. I hope we've not been guilty of it ourselves, but we've all experienced it and we know what it feels like. So the first thing is Shimei's willful folly. In other words, he reviled David before his people and before his family. This man, Shimei, he was a man of bad character. And he, was a, he had a wicked heart and he had a loose tongue. Now what is interesting when you come here, this man had become very bitter. And he attacked David when David was down. David was sitting on the throne, he never bothered him. It's when David was involved in his calamity and his son, uh, you know, opposing him. His son takes the throne, turns the people away from him. And so this man, uh, he was a very bitter man, a very angry man, and he took advantage of David's calamity and he attacks him and accuses him. David is barefoot, got his head covered, and he's weeping and he's leaving Jerusalem and is a very sad man, and so this man takes advantage of that. In other words, he has, this man has nursed a grudge for about 20 years. Saul, King Saul has been dead for around 20 years, and this man has accused David of killing the king and others, which he did not. And so he acted after Absalom's rebellion. This man could never go to David in person and sit down with him while he was on the throne and discuss these problems. 
He waited until he was down, and now he's bringing accusations, cursing him, throwing stones at him, kicking up dust, and accusing him of being a very bloody and murderous man. Notice with me also that as we come here, I want you to notice that he was a coward. Reading in verse 13, it says, And David and his men went up by the way. Shimei went alone on the hill's side over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. This man was a coward. He kept quiet the whole time that David was on the throne. But now... Uh, he's, he's out here cursing and throwing stones at a distance. He would never just sit down and talk with David and share his feelings and say, here's what I think is wrong or what is, uh, what you have done. What he did is he kept quiet until he could take it advantage. In other words, he could, uh, he could not face David in public sitting on the throne. And today, people are the same way. We got more avenues today than they had in biblical times. We got emails and texts and Twitter and Facebook and every other way to slander and to hurt people without sitting down and looking them in the eye in the presence of witnesses and actually dealing with problems. We find that in Matthew 18, verse 15 through 20, anytime there's a problem, we have a formula to go by. I mentioned that to you last week. We've actually got entire sermons on that in the years gone by. And the way that we deal with problems, it should be this way in a family or anywhere, but in church, the way you deal with problems is that you first talk to the individual, and if they won't listen, then you get witnesses and sit down where that others can hear it, and if they won't listen, then you bring it before the church. There's a formula. Very few will do the formula now. Well, this man was a coward, and he could not face David. He could not sit down with David. He waited until he's barefoot with his head covered, hurting, crying in tears and weeping on the run, and so he takes advantage upon this. He acted after Absalom rebelled against his father. So he's a coward. He's a coward. The second thing I want you to notice is that he's a liar. Notice in verse 7 and 8. Well, let me back up and read verse 6, 7, and 8. He says, And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus Shimei, when he cursed, come out, come out, thou bloody man. In other words, he's cursing him. You're a murderer, he's saying. And thou, and thou man of Belial. He's accusing him of being used of the devil. And he's also accusing him of murder. And he says in verse 8, And the Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul. He's saying, you're getting exactly what you deserve, David. And he says, in whose stead thou hast reigned, and the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Not only is he a coward, he is a liar. All we got to do is to read in 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel 26, and in 2 Samuel 4, and in 2 Samuel 9, and we can see the Bible shows clearly these charges are false. They're false. He couldn't talk to David when he's on the throne, but he's waiting until he's hurting and he's fleeing. He's no longer the king. And these are false. The Bible clearly shows us that when David was anointed as king, he waited and let God take care of Saul. And he had two opportunities to kill Saul, and he wouldn't do it. And he said that King Saul is the anointed of the Lord. So this man is not only a coward, he can't face David with witnesses and sit down and talk. He is a liar. Now, when we come to the Scriptures, the Bible has a lot to say about slander and gossip and whispers and whatever. We talked about that last week. 
So hold on to the text and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 26. In Proverbs chapter 26, I'm, I'm reading verse 4 and 5. Notice with me in verse 4 and 5. This thing about slander. The several words that are used in the Old and New Testament. Slander, gossip, insult, somebody being revengeful, whispers, malicious, backbiters, and there's many other synonyms. When we go through the New Testament, we read about this kind of stuff in Romans 1, verse 28 through the end of the chapter. Romans chapter 3 and verse 8. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 31 and 32. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8 addresses this. James 3, the entire, the entire chapter. Titus chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Galatians 5, verse 14 and 15, I read last Sunday. So the Bible has a lot to say about this. David even said himself in the book of Psalms, Psalm 31, verse 13, he said, I have heard the slander of many, and they took counsel against me. In Psalms 101, verse 5, it said, Whoso privately slandereth his neighbor shall be cut off. Proverbs 21, verse 28, speaks of bearing false witness. So in our text, the man that's slandering, that's bitter and angry, and can't draw David into a fight, uh, the Bible says that he's bearing false witness. Now notice as we come here to Proverbs 26, Proverbs chapter 26, how many of you ever heard the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? That's a lie. It's not true. Words are sometimes worse than physical wounds. I've had circumstances where I'd rather have physical wounds. They'll heal. The words that are spoken sometimes are hard to heal. And see, people don't realize that. So that's a, that little saying is a lie. It's not true. It's not true at all. Brother Ronnie Dahl said just passed Wednesday and was buried Friday. I've seen him go through some horrible slander. Not too many years ago. I've seen him go through things, and, and some of you know one of the persons that was involved in that. I've seen him taken before the courts in Honduras because of slander and lies. I've seen him have to spend thousands of dollars and go and drug before the courts because of lies that were being told on him from a wicked, vile reprobate. One time, there's a man walked in my office here, and this has been a long time ago, it's been... 25 or so years ago, I guess. Walked in my office and sat down, and, and he's sitting across from my desk and sitting in the chair there. And I said, what can I do for you? And it was a pastor that I knew. And he said, uh, he started slandering him. And before he could get a few minutes in his conversation, I reached over and picked up the phone, because his fact pastor, a friend of mine, I called the pastor, put it on speaker. And I said, brother, I said, I have one of your church members in my office and he's railing on you and slandering you. I said, is this so? I said, let's talk about it. What do you want me to do about this? The man got up, walked out of my office and he got, I mean, he just about ran out of my office and he left. And I told this pastor about a week or so after that, I said, this man is going to hurt your church. And I said, you need to deal with this now. And he said, oh no, it's going to be okay. He left and took several members about three months later out of the church. Slanders. Notice in chapter 26, and by the way, you'll find this again in chapter 27, verse 3, chapter 10, verse 18 and 19. In chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. But in chapter 26, it says in verse 4 and 5, it says here, I think we read this last week, he said, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. There's a time to never answer a fool. Then there's sometimes to shut a fool's mouth. And you've got to pray a whole lot to know which is which. Which? 
But notice he says, he says, answer, verse 4, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. You can't debate with a fool, you can't argue with a fool, because you're going to look just like him if you're drawn into that. I'm going to show you what David did with it. I'm going to show you what I've done with it for many, many years. And I'm going to give you some examples. One other passage. Notice with me in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and chapter 5. Notice here, I'm going to read just a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to show you how that we are to deal with that, especially if somebody calls themselves a brother. I'm reading from verse 11 through verse 13. This is a church setting. This man in the church that is sinning, but Paul speaks of some other things that are mentioned here. Notice it says here in verse 11, But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If a man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such one no not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? That's those without the church. We have no control over that. He said, do not ye judge that are them that are within. That's within the church, the assembly. Verse 13, but them that are without, God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So he's saying, he's saying when there's sin in the church, it's to be dealt with. You must deal with it as a church. And hopefully bring the individual to repentance. But he said, don't worry about those outside. He said, I'll take care of those. So he gives us a responsibility. But notice in this, he says in verse 11, the latter part of that, he mentions the word railer. And he's saying that if a person is a railer, that is a slanderer, he's saying don't even sit down and eat a meal with them. What is a railer? It's an, somebody who brings accu, accusation, somebody who is in, has an insulting language, somebody uh, would, that would utter reproach. In other words, slander somebody else. He says, don't keep company with them and don't sit down and have a meal with them. Turn with me, please, back to our text in Second Samuel and notice as we come back. Now, slander is a liar. In Revelation 21 and verse 8 says, All liars shall be cast into the lake of fire. I just believe that. And I believe it's so, and I believe that's their destiny. Now notice as we come back, we've talked about Shimei's willful folly. Alright, he was a wicked man. He was a man of a bad character. He loses his temper. He would get angry quick. He was bitter. And he would speak words that he, that he actually regretted later. Because when David got back on the throne, he came and bowed himself before David. And David could have took his head off, but David forgave him of his sins. But David never trusted his character. Because he knew why he'd done this before and now why he's changed. Because he didn't have the upper hand. He had a wicked heart and he carried a grudge. He was angry. And he wouldn't repent of his sins. Now, the second thing we want to look at is Abishai's bold recommendation. You'll notice with me that as we come to verse 9, in verse 9, the latter part of this, in, in verse 9, we find here in Abishai, verse 9, in the middle, middle of this verse, says, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? And here's what he said. He said, let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. So Abishai recommended, this is one of David's friends, and he loved his Savior. And I think of a man in the New Testament that wanted to do this. Remember Peter? He loved the Lord, didn't know what to do. He drew his sword out and was going to take somebody's head off. And the Lord says, put put it up, put it up. And... Um, and so we find here that Abishai, a friend, and he said, uh, he said here in this passage, notice uh, the rest of verse 9. Um, yes, coming back to verse 9, he says, Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. Now, he wanted to defend his king, his lord. 
And this is retaliation. Retaliation is usually the response of men, humanity. That's usually our response. But we're told in many places, Proverbs 25, 21, we're told in Romans 12, verse 17 through 20, I'm not going to read it because we're going to read it next week. The Lord said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. He tells us how to deal with it and it's not with vengeance. And Matthew 5, 44 clearly outlines how we are to treat and respond to our enemies. And so retaliation is the usual response of men. And we all have an Adamic nature and it will always respond in retaliation if it's not under control. Even little children know how to slap back if somebody slaps them. I mean, the little children will display this retaliation and we know that that's not the way that a Christian is to respond to things. Now, notice verse 9. We see here in this passage Abishai's recommendation. Thirdly, and I just want to keep that short because I want to spend most of my time on the third point, David's humble response. This is where we're really going to learn a lesson. And I learned this lesson many years ago, and I probably failed in it a few times, but I have been practicing this for many, many years. You're going to find that David submitted himself to God in his affliction and asked God to take care of the problem. In verse 10... We find here in verse 10 that David responds in the middle of this verse. And he says, So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David, who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? Here's David's response. David said, Let him curse. The Lord's allowed him to do this. He accepted the fact that in his affliction, God was still on the throne. And all we got to do is read through the book of Psalms and see this. He acknowledged the providence and sovereignty of God. He looked to God for His help and His guidance. This is why we sung Psalms 121 this morning. God allows men to sin, but He is not the author of sin. He allowed Satan to tempt Job. But God is not the author of sin. And sometimes God will allow things and even use people to come into our lives to chase us and purify us and bring us even closer to Him. But we got to learn how to respond to this properly. Now I want you to listen. Let me give you three examples before I get into really talking about David. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read these to you. One of them is Joseph. In Genesis chapter 45, verses 5 through 8, you remember the story of Joseph's brethren, don't you? How that they hated him, they wanted, some of them wanted to kill him, they put him in a pit, and they sold him into slavery, and then went back and lied to the father. Well, when time has come that Joseph ends up meeting his brethren, He says in chapter 45, verses 5 through 8, He said, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me thither, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years have the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. Verse 7, God and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Now, think about this. How do you do this? You can only do this by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit. Joseph had come to a place and he realized that God was using him to save an entire family and really an entire nation from which the Messiah would come. And he even says more. In chapter 50, here's what he says. Here's some of the last words we have. In verse 18, this is when all of them had come into Egypt now to live. In verse 18, 20, 19 and 20 says, And his brethren went, also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. 
And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Joseph not only saved his family, which turned out to be a nation, but he saved the Egyptians' lives as well from famine, seven years of famine. So Joseph just believed in the sovereignty and providence of God, And he may not have liked being in the pit and whatever, but he did not retaliate. He let God take care of the circumstances. And David did the same thing. We also have in the New Testament, in Acts 2, verse 23 and 24, that God allowed men to crucify the Lord Jesus. He didn't make them do it or command them to do it. He allowed them, and through that, God saved humanity. And then there's another example. Uh, this will be the third one, and we'll get back to our text. And that is Job. Uh, I doubt if many people read the book of Job unless they're having some trouble. Uh, it's, you probably just don't read it on a regular basis. But you know all that happened to Job. Uh, losing family, losing all of his money and assets and wealth and his children and whatever. But here's what he said in in Job uh, chapter 1, verse 20, 21, and 22. Then Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. And the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now, you and I read the book of Job, and we know that God provoked Satan. And God said to Satan, I've got a man on this earth that will not deny me. And Satan challenged him on that. And so, we read the book, and we kind of know what was happening. Job didn't know that. Job didn't know that he was the center battleground between God and Satan, and God was making a fool out of Satan. Because most men will deny the Lord under, uh, under calamity and, cer- and bad circumstances. But God used Job to make a fool out of Satan. So there's three examples. And let us come back to David now. And we're coming this time uh, to verse, um, uh, this time to verse um, 11. Notice with me in verse 11. And here's what David also said. Not only did he say, let this man curse, let him do, God's allowing him to do this. But he also said in verse 11, And David said to Abishai and to his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life, that's Absalom. How much more now may this Benjamite do? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. So God had allowed Absalom to do what he did. Of course, his life ended. God allowed Shimei to do what he did, and his life ended a few years after this. So what do we see here in this passage? David is admitting in verse 11, he said, We all need the chastening of the Lord at times. And you remember what happened with David and after he sinned and the prophecy that Nathan gave to him in chapter 12. And so David knew that he deserved much more punishment than anything like this. And he alluded here to Absalom. In other words, the circumstance there. So David's on the run because of Absalom. And there's some prophecy given on that. But David also is dealing with Shimei. And he says, the Lord has allowed this. And the Lord said, and David is basically saying, hey, I deserve much worse. But notice what he said. He says here in verses 12, And it may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction... And that the Lord will requit my, quit me rather good for his cursing this day. So in this verse, he's looking to God's goodness and mercy. Verse 13, and David and his men went, by the way, and Shimei went alone on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. Now notice. Verse 14, and the king and all the people that went with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. 
What do we get out of this? If we come back to verse 9 and 10, we see here that David looked to God for His goodness and mercy and believed that God would make note of his sufferings and that God would reward him. And again, we see the faith of David in all the Psalms that he wrote. But we see here that David did not respond back in reference to his enemy. He kept silent. Now, I want you to think about this. David kept silent. He submitted to God, and he did not return the slander. He did not debate it, because you can't debate or argue with a fool. Now, there's some men you can sit down and discuss things with. And if it don't get fixed, you bring it before witnesses. If it don't get fixed, you bring it before the church. That's the biblical way to do things. But somebody like Shimei, and, and you cannot do that. So David gave him the silent treatment. And by the way, that runs some people crazy. They'll even get madder, and they'll expose themselves even more. So David just went silent. That's the reason I said silent is golden sometimes when dealing with fools. Because if you get into the debate, you're going to be a fool yourself if you're not careful. Let's consider now the rest of the time the New Testament. Turn with me to 1 Peter in chapter 2, and notice here. In 1 Peter and chapter 2. We want to begin reading in verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 18. Now let's, let's go to our Savior. We could use many other examples. But let's go to our Savior and see how He responded to false accusations and anger and bitterness And all of these things. Notice as we begin in verse 18, reading from verse 18 through verse 25. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward, that is, the perverse and disobedient. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrong, wrongfully rather. In other words, suffering for God. Verse 20, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called. Now that calling is the suffering of verse 20. By the way, we have a calling to salvation in verse 9. He said in verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of Him who had called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. There's two callings in this chapter. One, we are called unto salvation. But the second one, as a Christian, we are called to suffer. Verse 21, For even here in two were you called... Again, the text is sufferings, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. Do we believe this? When I come back next Sunday morning and preach a message on Christian and writing, are we going to believe the Scripture, or are we going to believe people that are involved in all this stuff in our nation? And when I come back next Sunday night and we're in Thessalonians preaching on brotherly love, are we going to believe that or are we going to accept the world's philosophy? We have one of two choices in our life. And I've spoken about ten people this week and last week that's called me about the circumstances of our nation. And I said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to walk in His steps as closely as I can because that's the biblical way and the right way. It's the way of peace. So in verse 21, Jesus Christ, not politicians, Jesus Christ is our example and He says, follow in His steps who suffered at the hands of others. Do you realize that Jesus Christ, that He was 
not only suffered, but that he was called a blasphemer. Jesus Christ, they accused him of having a devil and being used of the devil. Just like David the king was accused of being used of the devil, David's son, the greater king, is also accused of being a devil or being used by the devil. They actually believed that Christ was a blasphemer. And Jesus Christ, according to Luke 23, 34, died on the cross. He was willing to die with them believing that He was guilty and pray for them. First words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He did not respond back with slander and anger and whatever to those people that slandered Him and crucified Him. So in verse 21, well, verse 20, suffering is acceptable with God. Verse 21, we are called to suffer. In verse 22, He's our example. Well, verse 21, He's our example. But verse 22, He's our example in holiness and purity and righteousness. Know this. He says in verse 22, He says, Who did no sin, neither was guile, there's another word, neither was guile found in His mouth. So the Lord never ever responded back in the way that men responded to Him. But not only that, notice with me in verse 23, He submitted Himself to the Father's will. He said in verse 23, "...who when He was reviled, reviled not again. And when He suffered, He threatened not, but committed Himself to Him, that is the Father, that judges righteously." And then He tells us in verse 24, who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, here's what he says, that we should live unto righteousness, by whose, then he says, and by whose stripes you were healed. I think this is clear. And when I come back and preach again, I usually, I didn't do it last July, but I usually do a sermon sort of on these lines about fighting and war and strife and divisions. I usually, for the last ten years, we've done a sermon around the 4th of July. This is just a good month to start out the year and just go ahead and talk about how should Christians respond to protests and writings? How should we respond to that? How should we respond to those that do us wrong? How should we respond to those that slander us and, and, and just, I mean, try to destroy us in every way possible. Well, notice now in chapter 3 and verse 9. In chapter 3 of 1 Peter and verse 9, you can turn loose, by the way, of 2 Samuel. We're not going back there. We're going to stay in the New Testament. But notice in chapter 3 and verse 9, he says this. Well, let me read verse 8 and 9 together because he's kind of bringing this letter, um, or this chapter to a close, he said in verse 8, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, that is, be merciful. Verse 9, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that we are there to call, that is, called to bless and not retaliate. Can I get an Amen. And then he says that you should inherit a blessing. And these are not, as you know, isolated passages in the New Testament. You know that. So this is how that we are to respond to these things. Now notice with me in Mark, let's say one more thing about our Savior, because He is the greatest example. Mark chapter 15 now, we have other examples in the Scripture. We have the Apostle Paul. We have Peter, James, and John, those in the early church. We have many examples, but our greatest is the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice with me as we come to Mark chapter 15, and I want to read a passage to you. And I want you to notice that Pilate himself, knowing that Christ was innocent of the charges... He marveled at the silence of Jesus Christ. He marveled at the silence. Let me say this again. He marveled at the silence of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ knew who He was and what He did, He did publicly. He did not do things secretly. He did publicly so He did not have to defend Himself. Amen. This is the biblical way. Notice in Mark chapter 15, reading from verses 1 through 5. It says, And straightway in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but, what's the next three words? He answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. And Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. I've been accused of many a times over the years of answering nothing or being silent. And people don't know what to do with it because they want to debate and argue. But never do anything the proper way. Never bring it through the proper formula that God has laid out in the church and among brethren and among Christians. Turn with me to James chapter 1. Now, I give you some biblical examples. What about a few personal examples? Thirty-one years ago this month, my first month in Kodan. Well, let me say this first of all. As I said a moment ago, I've been accused of giving the silent treatment a number of times over the years. Well, I don't argue with fools, slanderers, and angry people. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it in the future, and I haven't done it in the last 30-something years. I don't have to retract my words when I speak to someone because I'm careful in choosing my words. I don't have to get into a discussion with somebody and repent every time I talk to them. Because I choose my words, I think about what I'm saying, and I don't run off at the mouth. You've known me for all these years. I don't run off at the mouth and then say, well, I shouldn't have said that. What I've said last year, I meant to say, and I still believe. And what I've said so far this month, now if I do say something wrong, I will be very quick in repenting of it and confessing it. But in January 1990, 31 years ago, actually it ran through January through April into April into May. There was a preacher that slandered me and lied on me, told some horrific lies. My first month here, Brother Avery, you were with me. He got angry because of articles that I laid out on the table and got angry over some of the articles. And he actually hired somebody to run me out of town. Three men came in on me with, a, with guns to literally run me out of town. I kept trying to defend myself between January and February in, in that year in March. I kept trying to defend myself. I tried to get people to say, let's sit down together and talk about this. No, the slanderers wouldn't do that. Even the preacher. And so one day, I left. I was very perplexed. I went to Dolphin Island. It's the first time and the only time I've ever walked all the way to the West End. What is that? 14, that island, 14 miles? I took all day. I walked, I prayed, I cried and carried my Bible. Probably still got stains on from tears on the Bible, and I walked and prayed, and I went, I went to the end. That's the only time I've ever walked to the end of the west end of the island, from the east end. And along that route, the Lord taught me something. And He brought passages like John 19 and Mark 15, the one I just read, where the Lord 
He knew who he was. He knew what he was doing. He knew why he was here. He knew all that he said and done was in public. It was not in private. I said, that's it. The Lord never tried to defend himself. And from that day to now, 31 years, I have, I have accepted, I actually had done it before, but not as much as I have since then. I quit trying to defend myself. I never said another word. And over time, the Lord worked it out and dealt with the slanders. That same year, I went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana and, and preached in a meeting and publicly resigned from an organization that I felt like doctrinally, that they were going in a bad direction. Publicly resigned, told them all loved them, probably 20, 25 preachers, and told them I loved them and whatever, I just can't go along with this anymore. Walked away and I got letters. I got letters, letters. And accusing me of being lost and, and everything else. And I filed them in the trash can. And to this day, 31 years, have never responded back to any of those preachers. About 20, 25 of them in that meeting. They've hated me ever since. But I publicly was honest with them. And I did it publicly for a reason. Because I was in their association. In 1995, in February, from February to April, 26 years ago, we took a stand doctrinally about something in this church. I mentioned this last week, but Avery's involved in that. There was slander, there was threats. There was protest on two Sundays outside this door in the parking lot. People stood at the door and said, we're going to run you out of town. We're going to vote you out of this church. And the Sunday that it all came down, I stood right here for over an hour and never opened my mouth and let people say what they want to say and they left. But I had went the days before and to a, to a prayer meeting in North Alabama, 34 preachers, I made 35, and I said, I didn't come here to preach. I said, I come here for all of y'all to pray for me. And when they prayed for me, it was released, and I never had to say a word or do anything. Slander, private meetings, whispering, telephone calls, and all those kind of things, and I just let the Lord. And by the way, this is even on video. We still have video of this. So we would have it documented. 2015, I'm going to read now, I'm giving you some personal examples. Now, I've failed in some, but these are some that uh, I tried to stick with the, what Christ did. 2015, there was a Hollywood actor, as a matter of fact, from the Biloxi area, listened to me on the radio, got mad because I was preaching on the Trinity, wrote me a letter. The first few words are cuss words. It was a horrible letter. I read it. Filed it right there beside my desk in a trash can. It went into the fire later. Another letter. This man was angry. He was mad. Bitter. And another letter came. I read it. I filed it too. Never did respond. After two or three letters, he gave up. Did a funeral. Next month will be four years or even five years. I think four years. Five, Darlene's mother has some is a sorrowful time, but we had some people saved at the funeral. Got to go to the church that the one of them was baptized in and preach in that church before we came back home. But when we got back home, left some ugly emails. I actually knew who they were from, relatives. Read them. Darlene said, what do we do with it? I said, delete it. Another one came. Delete it. To this day, we've never responded back. I was accused of giving the silent treatment. Last year in 2020, and you know the story, ugly, ugly emails. I still have them. Texts and emails. I hadn't 
threw them away yet. I did not respond to the slander, but I said I'm willing to talk publicly with witnesses and before the church. And then there's a letter, you read it, that was mailed out, accusing me of being used of the devil. Remember that? And accused you too. It wasn't just me. And, I, and in one of the emails, the silent treatment. Brother Reed, you get you the silent treatment. If you would read the emails that I have, you would know why I went silent. If you would see the accusations and threats in these emails, and just the one letter alone is enough. So what did I do? I went silent. And I said to you, we can talk publicly, we can talk with witnesses, but not this, yeah, 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 in emails and texts and, and all this kind of stuff. This is silly. As adults, we need to be able to look each other in the eye as Christians and literally just sit down and talk about things and take the Scripture and take all the evidence and say, look here, this is either right or wrong and do that. That's God's way. The devil's way is to do it private and secret, whispering and whatever. So those are five. I could give you 25. <laughs> those are five personal examples. I got more. But I learned to respond the way Christ responds. If it's a fool, it's a slanderer. If somebody's sowing discourse, this is the way I'm going to always respond. And I learned later, I didn't even really understand the story of Shimei and David and Abishai, but then I learned David did the same thing. This is the biblical way if somebody, if you can't reason with somebody, or they will not publicly talk about things as Christians. Now, let me read in James chapter 1. If you're taking notes, James 3, the entire chapter, is dealing with the tongue. Dealing with the tongue, some tremendous things are that we're to... God says that cursings and blessings should never come out of the same mouth. You know, there should never be slander. And then on the other side, talking about God. And by the way, I forgot this. Shimei did all he did in the name of the Lord. He used religion. He said, the Lord, David, has brought this on you. The Lord has brought this. He said, I'm, I'm standing here in the name of the Lord. This wicked, vile person, he's using religion and the, and the Bible and the Lord to slander and curse David. Notice with me as we come to James chapter 1, we're closing here. And I hope these messages last week and this week are a blessing. And... Uh, been planning to do these for a while. I, I got to looking at Proverbs, and last week I thought, well, I want to go ahead and preach on sowing discord before we get to chapter 6, because I'm going to keep those seven together, you know, the seven things that God hates. And so we'll come back and look at it again, but it'll be in a shorter version than what I did last Sunday morning. Let us close here in this text, and I'm reading in James chapter 1. Verses 19 through 20. Now you in this church, you know that I'm open. My life is open. And I'll sit down and talk with anybody about anything as long as it's done in a proper order. I promise you I'll do that. I'll do it with anyone, anytime. And uh, that's to do it the biblical way. Notice as we come, would you stand with me as we read this last two verses? In verse 19 and verse 20, he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. He said in verse 20, here's the reason. For the wrath of man, that is man's anger, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Worketh not the righteousness of God. 
Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and mercy to us. We thank you for the privilege, again, to be able to assemble together. And Lord, I pray that we would meditate upon these scriptures. Uh, this week, we'd look them over, we'd think about them. Lord, help us to believe your word. And Lord, we just ask as a church that we'd be faithful to thy word, not to our feelings or what we think. We've all been guilty of that at times. But Lord, that we would be faithful to your work. We ask your blessings upon the remaining of the service. Amen.